Welcome. Uh, welcome to the World Changers Night, uh, Secure Your Future, the second edition of, of our um, uh, joint edition, edition of, um, of a program uh, that is focusing on innovation and, and, uh, and want to bring the Israeli know-how into, uh, uh, into Poland. We are focusing on cybersecurity. We have excellent guests here from Israel and from Poland, and I would like to thank uh, each and every one of you, um, experts, to uh, uh, share your, to, to agree to share your knowledge with us today. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the uh, organizers, the um, uh, Embassy of Israel in Poland, I would like to, um, uh, I would like to tell you what, uh, uh, and thank our partners, the Digital University Foundation, Tiku, uh, Tikunology Foundation, uh, Center for International Relations, um, uh, Institut Bezpieczeństwa i Strategii, uh, the Polish-Israeli Commerce uh, uh, Chamber, uh, Cyber Defense 24, Technologia Wspornicy, uh, Serendip Group, uh, Vital Voices, uh, Future Colors, uh, Znane Ekspertki and uh, the Brain Embassy, which is hosting our event here. Uh, thank you very much. And, yes. Um, and I would like to thank uh, each and one, one of the experts, uh, Doran Davidson, which will uh, be the keynote speaker of this tonight. Uh, please, Doran, introduce you. Like, this is Doran. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Yochai Koren, um, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Itai Sa uh, Savion. Uh, Ms. Olga Budziszewska from Accenture, thank you. Joanna Karczewska from Asaka. Uh, Mr. Andrzej Kozłowski, uh, that is here, great. And uh, Ms. Agnieszka Ostrowska, thank you very much. And uh, Helena Czarnecka and Katarzyna Dzit, thank you very much. For coming. I would like to start with a short video that maybe will explain you something that you, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you mm, haven't uh, realized. While you're watching this video, over 50,000 cyber attacks will occur worldwide. About 4,500 of them will be launched against Israel's strategic assets. 99.9 .9 of these attacks will fail. Welcome to Israel, the world's cyber capital. To face these increasing threats, in the year 2000, the Israeli government has targeted the cyber industry as its main investment focus. Since then, over 350 security and cyber startup companies have been set up around the country, most of them by military intelligence graduates. As a matter of fact, Israel has more cyber companies per capita than anywhere else in the world. More than 10 academic excellence centers were opened where great minds are recruited to promote cybersecurity education. Together, they're developing groundbreaking solutions for critical infrastructure security, prevention of cyber crimes and cyber-based terrorism, and protecting financial institutions worldwide. This Israeli pioneering industry has increased to a revenue of over $3.7 billion last year. That is why the biggest tech corporations chose Israel as their cyber R&D center, and foreign governments have signed knowledge sharing and operational collaboration agreements with Israel. While you're watching this video, the Israeli government Industry and Academy are working hand-in-hand hand to promote awareness and know-how to make the world a safer place. This is Israel. This is the world's cyber capital. Uh, thank you. So, before I... Uh, uh, the ambassador uh, will uh, say a few words. I would like to acknowledge that the director of the cybersecurity department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry 
of uh, Digital Affairs is here with us, Mr. Robert Koshla. Thank you very much. Ms. Ambassador Alexander Delsi. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. We had time, you know, before we started, uh, we had some time for mingling. So some of you I, I met, I said hello personally. Uh, for those who do not know me yet, I just started here in Poland three months ago as an ambassador and uh, as uh, you know, one of our prime targets is to make uh, the cooperation between Israel and Poland actually with much more substance every day. One of the, why we decided uh, about cybersecurity I don't have to explain, you just saw the video. So, uh, yes, we are this, this industry, and becomes it has to be an industry, now starts to be a very important uh, ingredient in our uh, development, in our exports, uh, in our cooperation between countries. As it was mentioned, that we signed several cyber agreements, government to government, and actually with Poland we signed uh, this summer, uh, so we are very happy about it, and uh, we will actually speaking with the director about uh, the future, uh, the future implementation of this government-to-government -government agreement. Now uh, it's important the, this agreement, but finally the cooperation is done not only by the governments, I would say mainly by the companies, by the Israeli companies, Polish companies, uh, international companies, and part of this meeting. I presume would be a little bit of this exchange of knowledge, ideas, and contacts. Now, uh, before I finish, I would like to remind you all that in January, actually the 28th of January, we have our cyber tech in Israel. So it is, uh, I would suggest all those who are interested in, in this subject will uh, not only take note, but actually inscribe themselves to this event because it is the biggest world event in this uh, in this subject of cybersecurity. Definitely, the Israeli companies who are present here will be present there as well, uh, and uh, you will have uh, well head start because you met them before it started there. Uh, when if you need uh, more information about the, the cyber tech, we have the representatives of uh, of uh, the Ministry of Economy. Of Israel, actually, our economic attaché Saran Madi, please stand up. Thank you. And her team, who is also uh, present here, and they will be more than glad to give you more information about uh, this event and help you to participate in it. So uh, I don't want to take too much time of actually practical things. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for coming today the director of presenting, uh, you know, the governmental uh, part of it, all of you that represent uh, business, academia, all the uh, organizations that are dealing with that, and I wish you a very fruitful <coughs> evening. Thank you. And I would like to um, invite Mr. Director uh, Robert Koshla to say a few words on behalf of the Minister of Digital Affairs. Thank you very much and good evening everybody. And I would like to, to, to thank you for the invitation for this very important event. And it's not important because, uh, because it's important, but it's important because we are creating the ecosystem, as you mentioned, the ecosystem in Israel. And uh, on behalf of uh, Minister Marek Zagorski, the Minister of Digital Affairs, I would like to stress, of course, the importance of, of uh, our multinational cooperation just yesterday, we had an event uh, hosted by U.S. Embassy together with Federal Bureau of Investigation, just leveraging the, the need for international collaboration on, especially to exchange information that uh, are about uh, cyber, um, cyber criminal activities and also state-sponsored attacks against our economy. So even if geographically we are quite distant from each other, in Poland to Israel, in cyberspace we are very close to each other. And I think we face the same, the same challenges. Uh, especially for growing and modern economies that you observe the, uh, that you observe in Israel uh, and we observe in Poland um, we can I think we can bring to the table our 
uh, inputs regarding situation awareness, cyber situation awareness, of course, and that's the area where we would like to cooperate with, with Israel directly. The area where we would like to cooperate and um, facilitate cooperation be between Polish, um, Polish uh, companies involved in cybersecurity business, especially crypto. This is actually the area of the business-to-business -business, uh, collaboration. We will, we will try to support this, this initiative, these activities. Uh, we will leverage uh, the agreement that was signed on 25th of June uh, with uh, National Cyber Directorate, uh, subordinated to Prime Minister of Israel. On our side, it was NASC and uh, Research Institute, but mainly it was actually the CSERT, um, CSERT NASC, uh, getting or receiving the information about the incidents and handling the incidents and building our, our cyber capacity. Also, uh, there, there was proposal from Poland uh, to work together on uh, the next generation of uh, uh, early warning system on uh, just leverage the, the outcomes of the project uh, finance from EU funds uh, that we would like to develop further. That's at CISDEN, the, the network of sensors, just to build our uh, regional, um, regional um, situation awareness. What's more, I think, this type of meetings uh, will help us to better understand each other, to better understand our potential, to find the uh, specific uh, areas where we can cooperate closer. And uh, as Ambassador mentioned, we would like to, and we will follow up with discussion about specific or the very, uh, very detailed uh, implementation plan, how to uh, develop our, our cooperation, how to develop uh, our cooperation with like-minded countries, and we, of course, we see uh, uh, Israel within, the, within this group. So first, uh, as you can, you can find in the cybersecurity strategy document that was signed by Prime Minister on the 30th of October, uh, of October so quite, quite recently adopted document for the next five years of our activities. Of course, one of the key areas is multinational cooperation and uh, uh, capacity building uh, in, in cybersecurity. So, of course, um, building our, our cooperation with Israel together with, uh, with uh, NATO countries, together with EU countries and like-minded countries. We just discussed before the, the meeting started with about co collaboration already established with Australia, already established with Japan and, and uh, South Korea. Those are actually the, the, the countries that think that thinks similarly about uh, cyber threats, about cyber attacks, cyber activities, and also the code of conduct in cyberspace. So I would like to, to, to wish you a very fruitful uh, discussion. I, I've seen the moderators uh, of, the, of the round tables. You, you selected the best, the best persons, actually, um, for, for those topics. And the topics are selected very, very good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy and I support, strongly support Mrs. Kaczewska about uh, the topic to engage more and more women into, into cybersecurity. I may say, I may declare that in my department there are 30% of women, so we are not so not so bad if you compare to other other governmental uh, bodies, and also I may say also a lot of companies in the business space. So thank you very much, and I, I, I wish you the best the best um, results of the discussions. That I will be happy to join next uh, next um, uh, events that you will arrange under umbrella of cybersecurity, common cybersecurity activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and with no further ado, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Doron Davidson to give his keynote speech. Mm. Ms. Doron, I'm reading malware to my uh, machine? Yes, yes, just uh, some trials and, oh. and viruses. <laughs> so, cool. I like the newer types <laughs> of uh, malware. Can you hear me at the end? They can hear me at the end, but they cannot hear me here, so I'll have to use the microphone. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. My name is Doron Davidson. I'm the co-founder and VP Business Development at SecBI, Security Breach Investigation. We basically help organizations detect, investigate, and respond to cyber threats. But I'm not here to talk only about my company, but rather to talk about some of the things that I have seen with some of the uh, customers' prospects that I visited. So I visited the prospect, I think four or five months ago, uh, in North America, a medium to large financial institution, over uh, 50,000 employees. And uh, during my visit there, so as always, I go, I sit with a SOC manager, 
uh, I asked him about uh, the three P's, the people, products, processes that he has within his security operations center uh, to kind of understand what's happening. While I'm doing that, the system is already starting to crunch some uh, historical data to, so that at the end of my questions, I can actually show him some interesting stuff. Uh, as I'm uh, asking him those, uh, those questions, I asked him, hey, by the way, did, did something interesting happen here in the past uh, two weeks, four weeks, uh, two months, six months? He says, oh, yeah, actually, two months, two weeks ago, one of our uh, executives in the organization started spamming the whole organization, started sending a lot of emails. I'm sure it's not, it doesn't sound familiar to you so far, but... Uh, <laughs> By the way, spamming, uh, it can be an email, it can be in uh, WhatsApp, in SMS, when my wife sends me, buy uh, bread, buy bread, did you buy bread? Don't forget to buy bread, the last three are spam. The first one was enough for me to understand that I need to buy bread. But um, apparently that, uh, that spamming came in a very simple way. Someone sent him a phishing email and he pressed on that link, he actually lost his credentials and then someone used his account in order to send spam. So this came from their investigation, regardless of FBI and so on. I said, okay, let's, uh, let's run that, uh, that, that credential, that, uh, uh, that user ID on FBI. So we did. What we actually found is that it wasn't a phishing attack. It was actually a phishing campaign, maybe even spear phishing, I'd say, against three of the executives in the organization. One of them started spamming a couple of days later. The other two, during the spamming, they were actually sending email information from the organization with some sensitive information from that financial institution. Now that's a breach. So far it was, yeah, we had a minor incident. Now suddenly it's a breach. Now, it's not about the fact that um, there was phishing. Phishing happens everywhere. By the way, did you know that about 32% of all successful attacks start or involve phishing? Now I, I, I also know that not everyone here from cybersecurity, so for those that aren't phishing, is when I send an email with, um, a, a, with the link, I'm trying to get someone into a fake attack, into a fake website, where on that website they need to put their credentials. Either communication happens be, behind the scenes into the real uh, uh, site or not, and I just gain their credentials. I can then do with those credentials anything I want. Um, those, uh, uh, those can be the credit card uh, details if I'm taking them to a Madonna site to buy tickets or if I'm taking them to their bank account, I can actually get uh, the details of, of their bank account. In this case, it was actually the credentials for their webmail. Now, uh, phishing is a simple attack. If I want now to attack or to gain access to some, um, uh, some customers of one of the banks here, is there anyone from PKO Bank? No? PKO. Profit? Sorry? What is PKO? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just wanted to pick on one of your banks. Uh, in I'm one of them. So. What's the other one? Well, one is three letters, PKO, and the other one is five letters, P-E-K-A-O. And you're from? The five letters. Okay, so PKO, the three-letter one. <laughs> I want to attack them. So there's a service. It cost me about two cents to send uh, phishing emails um, across uh, Warsha, for example, and I want to send 50,000 of those emails. So it's going to cost me, what, 100,000 cents, uh, $1,000 or so. So I'm sending uh, uh, 50,000 of those emails uh, across uh, Warsha. I'm trying to target PKO three-letter uh, customers. <laughs> Only about 16 to 18% of the people are actually PKO customers. So I got about 20,000 of those, uh, not 20, 15,000 of those people. Um, out of those 15,000 that got an email that are actually a PKO uh, customers, uh, half of them are not at home, so, so they didn't even open their, their, their email. Another half of them are security savvy, so they wouldn't even open those, those, those emails. I'm still left with about 4,000 people that clicked that link that went and lost their credentials. By the way, about 25% uh, of them don't even remember the real password, so they didn't lose anything. So I'm, uh, I'm down to about 3,000 people that actually lost their credentials. 3,000 people I can sell in the, um, in the dark web 
for about three dollars per person. So I made I just made nine thousand dollars. It cost me one thousand dollars to send. Here's a profit of eight thousand dollars. That's why you want to be a cyber criminal. It actually pays off, unless you're caught. And then I understand that in uh, uh, prisons uh, in Poland it's kind of cold, so maybe it's not a good idea. But um, so it pays off to be a cyber criminal. Um, <clears throat> But still, I made only $8,000. What if I told you that I can make the phishing attack much better? It will actually be a, an AI-based phishing attack. So I will uh, utilize AI-based crawlers, artificial intelligence crawlers, that will actually crawl the web, uh, will go into Facebook, will start building profiles of each and every one of you to know what is your real bank account. Um, over there, I can find um, in Facebook people that say, oh, I've just uh, stood in line for 20 minutes at PKO Bank, and it was awful. Okay, I know uh, one who's a real PKO customer. Uh, but I can also f uh, uh, find yes, someone else that said, PKO is the best bank account. I'm getting excellent credit there. I found two of them. I can also find on LinkedIn uh, 10,000 of PKO employees. I got now 10,002 people that I know are actual employees. So I don't need to send it to 50,000 people. I'm only sending it to 10,002 uh, that are actual PKO customers. I assume that any PKO employee is also a customer. At least I hope for them. PKO. Um, and then, uh, and then I, 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 can, uh, I can now create a spear phishing attack only for those people. I know already what's their real bank. I know uh, I, I can find additional information. By the way, I probably don't even to, uh, need to do phishing because on Facebook I will also find people that said happy birthday to my mother. So I can find her uh, mother's maiden name. I can find her uh, birth date. And probably that's how uh, you authenticate on PKO Bank uh, whenever they, uh, um, uh, you lost your password. So utilizing an AI-based attack, I can suddenly be more a uh, professional, do it better, faster, simpler, and not waste the thousand dollars that I had to waste on sending 50,000 emails. I'm just sending now 10,002. So that's about uh, phishing. <clears throat> um, by the way, when, uh, uh, when uh, banks wants to call me and, uh, and tell me that uh, something might have happened on, on the account, I usually ask them some questions to also authenticate the bank and not only that they will authenticate me. Um, and uh, attackers are also trying to do that. It's called, instead of phishing, it's called vishing with voice. Um, and for that as well, they will be using the same profiles against people that have gathered information in order to be able to ask questions. Now, when I ask uh, the bank questions, usually they answer me with the information that they have um, about my credit card transactions. Last week I was uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, so they might be able to tell me um, you've done a transaction in a, in a bookstore uh, or in a Starbucks uh, in the Bay Area, and last week you've been uh, to London and uh, you've also done a transaction at Starbucks in London. Great. Now it might actually be that uh, on Facebook I've posted my picture in Starbucks. Therefore, even an attacker can now know that I've been to the Bay Area, that I've been to London, been at Starbucks, most likely I paid with a credit card, who still has cash here. Uh, but if you do have cash, you can leave tips on the table. Um, and, um, uh, and, and now attackers can also call me and say, hey, there's there been a security breach. We ask you to go online uh, and change your password or do something else. Trick me into giving them additional information to make it easier for them to then um, hack my, uh, my uh, account. Second. Another case, another story. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, about a year ago to a large manufacturer. When I say large, it's over 2,000 employees worldwide, 200,000 employees worldwide. Everyone uses their product, I'm not going to say who they are, but um, they have state-of-the-art security operations center. They are, uh, uh, they've deployed in their security, uh, in their security processes. Uh, they have 
Minecast for their email security. They have a CrowdStrike for the endpoint security. They have a, a Zscaler as well as some places BlueCode because they're buying also companies, so, so they have different, uh, different systems of those. Uh, they have excellent processes, they have hunting, they have everything. Uh, over 60 person security operations center. Still, uh, when we came there to, to, to deploy, we set the system up, and what we found is that seven different users have received a word attachment. Now, receiving a word attachment, you remember we just uh, uh, talked about uh, spear phishing. Spear phishing being expensive, but still, if you attack such a large company, you want to gain some information, it might be worth a while. Um, so you get an email from your CFO about the end of the year. Uh, please uh, look at the numbers, make sure that your division is indeed, uh, uh, all the numbers are correct. Great. Three people actually pressed on it. The other four, it's not that they didn't uh, see the email, uh, or it's not that they <laughs> saw the email, they just went for lunch. Um, those three had, uh, had pressed that, uh, that file, that file, launched a macro, that macro launched a rat on their uh, systems. Rat, for those that don't know, a remote access tool. With remote access tool, I can actually do anything that I want on your machines. And it's not that hard, by the way, to get your remote access tool, especially if I'm using an AI-based phishing. Um, <clears throat> but that, uh, uh, the idea of that, that remote access tool was actually to install the malware uh, onto the machine. Now, once I install the malware on a machine, it's not that the malware can do anything that I want. I, I, I had to actually program the malware as to what I wanted to do. Uh, now, if I'm looking for a specific database with the formulas of some interesting, uh, some interesting food that they actually manufacture, uh, I need to tell the malware that you need to find now from the person that actually uh, that, that I got access using the remote access tool, you need to find an administrator. That administrator needs to have access to a database. That database that needs to decrypt the information and then send the information out, find a way to get out from the organization. It's complicated. And to do that, I need to tell the malware every time one step of what to do. <coughs> to move from this person to someone else, from that person to someone else, to gain access eventually to an IT manager that has access to the database, uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Every time that communication is done via command and control. That command and control is a way for many detection systems, by the way, to detect that there is malware uh, moving around within the organization, uh, trying to find interesting information, as well as, by the way, that filtration itself can also be done using the same mm -hmm. destinations. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so but, uh, they've installed this, uh, this remote access tool, they've installed the malware, it started moving on uh, until eventually some of the data were, were exfiltrated via email in this case. So once it found the data, it went back to the last person that it knew uh, and sent the email out from the organization. Uh, no serious checks on, uh, on those emails, especially if the file is zipped and encrypted and, and, encrypted, uh, and therefore uh, someone it gained access, I think, from 12 gigabytes, 12 gigabytes of data, wow. Uh, some of the alerts actually jumped within the Security Operations Center, some of the things they were able to find, uh, mainly due to that command and control communication. Uh, some of it uh, thanks to threat intelligence that they, were, that they were utilizing and so on. What if I had told you that I can now bring in a malware um, that is AI-based, that, done, that doesn't need to communicate with a command and control. I'm gonna teach that malware how to find that IT manager, how to find from that IT manager the, the database, how to find the data, and also how to find the right and best way to get the data out from the organization without being detected. How that malware can either send an email, open an FTP port, and send all the data out. Well, it's not a dream. There are such malwares still in labs. Some of the labs are from the people that are trying to defend us. Some of the labs uh, in uh, Russia, China, Poland, Israel, and other places of people that are trying to attack us. Good guys. This is the good guys, right? I'm at the right conference? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, once all of those uh, uh, labs will be releasing their codes, 
suddenly we're going to see more and more malwares. By the way, there are a few attacks that we know of uh, that have utilized it, but there aren't many, and it's mainly governments against governments. Uh, but we are going to see that more and more in uh, non-government entities uh, being attacked uh, and uh, information is being stored. Um, <clears throat> so why all of that is happening? Well, artificial intelligence is being used in many different areas, uh, supervised, unsupervised, uh, you have many detection systems, you have many, uh, that's in cybersecurity, but not only. Um, you, you, you also have uh, artificial intelligence used in, uh, in computer vision, in uh, speech recognition, and so on, in our real life. But now, think what, what's going to happen if uh, someone is going to put malware on every LG monitors worldwide that has a, a, that has a camera. Suddenly, they are now able to recognize who are the people that are, that are being listened to, that are being viewed, because you cannot gather information about everyone. I mean, even China, they have a, a X amount of storage that they can keep. But if I can uh, recognize the right people that I want to listen to, now that becomes scary. Are you going to check each and every one of your IoT devices at home? By the way, some of the Israeli security <coughs> companies here can actually help you with that. But still, <laughs> uh, it's going to be extremely expensive, extremely complicated to do that as a private person and not only as, as an organization. Now, some of the malwares that are being developed and even being used are already using that. So just imagine if someone wants to attack Mr. Ambassador here. Um, they might uh, put the malware all around uh, the, the embassy, uh, but they don't want to be detected. So instead of being detected, what they will actually do, they will only encrypt the information that they want to be sent out once they recognize uh, Mr. Ambassador's face on the camera. Only then they will know, oh, I found the right person that I want to steal his information and his information only. Then I can uh, halt his machine, I can encrypt it and so on and say, we want $1 million or uh, we're going to delete all of this information. What's the first thing that he's going to do? Well, he's going to pick up the phone, call me or call one of the other security experts. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I'm putting the same malware on his phone as well. I'm going to encrypt the phone once he's going to look at it as well. So face recognition is extremely um, is extremely dangerous when you want to do targeted attack. So I'm Mr. Ambassador. I'm not really going to do that. <laughs> uh, I will pay them extra hundred thousand just to take it and keep it. <laughs> keep the phone and answer all my emails instead of me. <laughs> uh, what, about, uh, uh, what about adaptive um, uh, uh, worms? There are many different security, excellent security controls out there, security products, firewalls that can actually look for all those permutations uh, for, for that malware that, uh, uh, that changes over time and so on. What if I'm a malware, if I'm a worm that wants to get to a certain database or somewhere, and I can recognize when there's a system that is trying to trick me, then I can actually look for a different way around. I can actually look for a higher privileged accounts uh, that are not being checked and so on. That's already out there. Um, independence from uh, command and control we've already talked about. Uh, better reconnaissance, phishing, uh, uh, doing it more of a spear phishing. We talked about that, extremely dangerous, using artificial intelligence, obviously. Um, utilize existing tools. One of the things that you usually want to put on systems are malware that are very small, very small so that they will not be detected by many other systems. They have a very small footprint. To do that, they need to be able to utilize existing tools uh, that, that already exist by the operating system. It's called leave of the, uh, of the land. Uh, you, you only utilize the existing systems, operating systems and, uh, um, uh, and processes out there. But obviously, and that's one of the key elements here, making faster decisions. Malware needs to be able to make faster decisions, faster than the protector. It's hard, they're working on it, but we need to be even faster. We need to make sure that every security operation out there, every security operation out, out there, it works with their existing processes, with their existing people and their existing products to utilize those kind of systems, systems that can uh, uh, fight 
artificial intelligence with artificial intelligence. System that can take the advantages of human beings utilizing those kind of products in order to fight those kind of attacks. Then and only then, organizations can be safe enough. So we talked about people, and obviously you need to, uh, uh, to train them to, to increase awareness and the professionalism, obviously, uh, of, uh, of your security operations uh, uh, teams in general. Uh, making sure that you have the right processes in place, uh, the right products, innovation. By the way, products, it's not just about buying new products. Make sure that if you buy something, you can throw something out. You don't want to have 100 different security products or different products in general. But sometimes there are new attacks that you actually need to have and brand new product. Make sure that you test, make sure that you know, make sure that you throw old stuff because they are generating gaps and vulnerabilities that you don't even know that you have within your environment. Uh, and the, the fourth P that I'm, that I'm actually adding is proactiveness. Make sure that you perform a, a, a emulation. Make sure that your management team is not making a security incident the first time when it actually happens. Make sure that you train both the people, the management, the board of directors, what to do when an incident actually happens. Um, and also, threat hunting, be proactive, looking for those kind of threats, looking for those uh, uh, systems that are crawling within your, uh, uh, your data, whether to steal or change the data itself. Uh, you need to look into your network as though it's already been breached and make sure that your organization can work under an attack. Uh, we've heard a story this morning, those uh, of us that uh, were here also this morning, about... Uh, a hospital that have been breached, that hospital needed to keep on working while it is under attack. Well, it's not just hospital. It can be your, your, your energy company, your water company. They, they might be attacked, and when they are, they need to be able to work and continue working while they are still under attack. But also, there are many third-party vendors that you're, uh, um, that, that you're, you're all utilizing. Make sure that they have similar processes to yours that they are also making sure that they protect themselves to make sure that they are not your weakest link. Now, uh, I was uh, uh, quite fortunate uh, that uh, Mr. Chemek Demba, uh, the CISO of Orange, had agreed to also come and give a few of his thoughts uh, around how to build a better security operations center, how they have built an amazing operations and have, uh, have been there. Uh, so if I uh, may ask you, Thank you, Dylan. Uh, just two remarks. I'm not Mr. and Przemek. And the second one, I'm PKO customer. So. <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay. I'm sorry for that, but uh, I just got some small stage fright because I'm a little bit surprised by attendance of Vice President of our company, Brzona Wyśniewska. <laughs> Żona, forgive me, please, if I say something wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, and now I'm, I'm really happy that, that, uh, that I'm here together with Doron. I will try to explain why. And uh, I will try also to be a part of Doron's story. Uh, advanced SOC, Orange Advanced SOC, because uh, this is the one of really popular expression. What does it mean, advanced SOC? You can call it also next generation SOC or SOC Plus or something like that. Unfortunately, the answer is that nobody knows because such expressions uh, usually are invited by the companies delivering such uh, services to the market uh, to differentiate from uh, uh, very competition. However, if we put this question in proper context, and ask what artificial intelligence can bring to our um, security operations, I think we can get back quite uh, specific conclusions. When we are talking about uh, SOC, we are thinking mainly about three resources, the tools, the processes, and, uh, and people. Uh, let's start with tools. There are usually two uh, basic kind of the tools, tools for the de detection tools and tools supporting the processes. And at the beginning, 
uh, the, the, the basic one, the, the main monitoring tool, was just mailbox, where we are waiting for the uh, mails from our users, we are protected, uh, with information that they notice something strange, and we should uh, investigate it. Uh, you have to admit that it is not the most efficient uh, way of uh, operation and, and extremely reactive. That's why security people started to develop their own uh, detection tools. Uh, initially, all the detection tools uh, were based on the uh, really static rules, uh, based on <coughs> static correlations between uh, data from different systems uh, with reference to the also static uh, list uh, with uh, identica identicators of compromise. Uh, and the issue here was that generally you had to predict what happened. Uh, if you didn't predict, you would be in the, in, in the trouble. Apart from that, it, it required a lot of um, workflows and uh, was extremely time consuming. After that, the next generation of detection tools, especially in the area of malware detection, uh, was sandboxing. Sandbox, this is, let's say, uh, real-time operating lab, uh, which checking and testing the malicious uh, samples and uh, tell us what this malicious sample is going to do. But, unfortunately, uh, there is still a lot of different ways to bypass sandboxes. Uh, better sandboxes, better ways to, to bypass. And what here can uh, artificial intelligence bring? Uh, we are able, thanks to that, to, to analyze, to track incredible uh, amount of data. And thanks to intelligent anomaly detection, we can uh, detect even something uh, was uh, which wasn't happened yet. Something completely new, just 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 developed, just prepared by by criminals. Moreover, uh, such a systems allow us uh, to see, let's say, um, uh, entire path of the attack, entire scenario, as uh, we are able to enrich data uh, in proper way. Uh, and to, to, to show this data already ordered, already collected to, to SOC analysts, uh, which generally perfectly uh, opt optimizes uh, um, their jobs. Okay, the given processes, at the beginning, there wasn't processes and in, in security uh, teams at all. There was just one guy, this guy, knew everything about his organization, about cybersecurity, about everything. But the problem is that if we want to, to run big scale of operation, where to find a lot of such guys? How to hire these guys in, in a big number? Do we comment something? Yeah. No, no, uh, just uh, two, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> this, please. And um, so, after that, it appeared some, some uh, written processes uh, you had to follow. Uh, thanks to that, it will uh, be told to the world. Uh, if we have something described already, why not automate that? Okay, we can automate. But still, we are not able to... to, to to map our organization, our, our skills, uh, shifts, and the, the, the idea of artificial intelligence deployment here is why not to build processes in real time? Uh, why not route our incidents, our tickets automatically? Uh, okay, and I have one minute, so still there is a question if, if Orange Sock is, is advanced at all. Uh, there's just one thing more, people, uh, at the beginning in, in security teams there's one guy, this guy who knows everything, 
Uh, in our stock currently, we have numerous uh, job positions which are uh, well defined, and number of job positions in our stock is growing rapidly. This is, you know, like a, I don't know, it's proper English expression, uh, budding reproduction. Uh, what what can what can you say more about advanced soft? So I like to explain cyber world uh, by analogy to the real one. So advanced means more or less like mature. Uh, to to have something mature, to be mature, uh, firstly you need to uh, take long time. You need to take experience. Uh, our stock uh, history is as long as history of Polish internet, so we have a lot of time to get experience, but it is not enough because it's easy to dismiss being mature, mature with, with being just rotten. So there are additional conditions. Uh, you need also to be challenged, challenged by your customers, uh, by certificates you got, you can see our certif certificates over there, uh, but also you need uh, be open enough for innovation. That's why I'm here with Doron. <laughs> so this is the end of explanation. By the way, uh, uh, Doron, uh, CBI is not the, the only one uh, company from Israel we cooperate with. Uh, actually, majority of vendors with the new ideas, new products, visiting every week uh, my office are from the same country. I know why, there are several explanations, a lot of factors, but the, my favorite one explanation is by the Jewish word, chutzpah. <laughs> uh, how to translate into English? Chutzpah can, 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 can mean critical thinking, or, or maybe uh, being able to solve the problems in an unexpected way, or maybe doing something from nothing. And all these three features, all, all these three uh, use cases, are uh, typical personal uh, features for every cyber security professional. Uh, are typical features for hackers. So maybe this explanation, however, take it easy, because the word chutzpah is also presented in Polish language, in Polish vocabulary, you can find it also. Uh, the meaning is more or less the same, so probably this is the best reason to carry on our uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. So now it explains why there are so many similarities and why there is a growing uh, market of cybersecurity companies here in Poland as well. Well done. Uh, so I, uh, I'm just going to wrap up before you throw me off the, uh, off the bench. Um, I just want to say a couple of, uh, couple of last things. We, we all need to understand that uh, while we're talking about security of organizations, enterprises, governments, and so on, eventually we're talking about people. And people uh, have a tendency to think differently sometimes within their, uh, their, their private life versus their organizational life and so on. You need to remember that when you're attacked on your phone or when your phone uh, uh, or when credentials uh, of your phone or your Gmail account and so on uh, fall into the hands of a hacker. It's just a step away from getting into the organization as well. Uh, I was planning to actually show you uh, from Google Security my own account. I found out that uh, I, I urge each and every one of you to go into your either Google Security or uh, iOS Security and so on and check your device. Apparently, I had a device uh, a bit over a year ago. I changed devices. I gave my old device to my son. And when you check in Google accounts, uh, in Google security, it actually tells me that there is an active account of the run on uh, another phone that has not been used for over 300 days. Now, I know where that phone is. My son has it. Uh, he might lose it uh, uh, one day and so on. But still, make sure to clean your own accounts, even on the personal level, not only uh, at, at an enterprise level, because you'll be surprised what you're going to find there. I found a game that my son installed, uh, Pac-Man. I don't know why a 10-year-old need uh, Pac-Man, something that I used to play when I was 10 years old, but it was 40 years ago, 30 years ago. But, uh, but still, that, that Pac-Man, as opposed to all other games, it had access not only to Google Play, but also has access, for some reason, to my Google Drive. There is no reason why a game needs to have access to your Google Drive. Check 
what you have in your phones. Thank you very much. I hope it was uh, interesting, and uh, I'm here for an additional question. Thank you very much, Doron. Now I would like to... Uh, we're we're going to go through the panel discussion uh, with Doron, so please uh, sit down already here with one of the chairs, maybe the second one. And I would like to invite uh, Ms. Olga Buczyszewska from Accenture to join us, uh, and uh, Ms. Joanna Karczewska, um, that will also join us in the panel. We're very delighted to have you. Uh, Mr. Grzegorz Małecki, um, and uh, uh, the moderator will be Andrzej Kozłowski from uh, Cyber uh, Defense 24. Um, so I will give uh, you the floor, and uh, please. And it's uh, easy questions, right? <laughs> Only easy ones. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, uh, so we'll speed up with the most uh, crucial question. But uh, when we are talking about the cybersecurity future, uh, there are two, two things uh, which are pretty obvious. The first one, that uh, we'll have uh, more and more uh, cyber attacks. And the second one, that uh, we'll probably um, pay more and more for the cyber attacks. And this is quite, it's pretty simple. But now I would like to ask, uh, our distinguished guest for something more difficult. When you're thinking about uh, cybersecurity future, uh, what you're afraid of, and uh, maybe also you can, to give you more optimism, uh, what technology or what things give you some positive aspects about the cybersecurity futures? And I would like to start with this question uh, with Mrs. Joanna Kaczewska. The old lady, right? <laughs> My main worry would be um, whether we are up to it. It's not the technology that makes me afraid. It's the people behind it. And I don't mean the bad guys. I mean the structures that are supposed to protect me. That is the biggest uh, weakness. We have great guys like Doron who who uh, know what to do, who know how to develop new technology, but are we able to use it everywhere? Because that, that's the main point. In the old days, when I started, we had several data centers closed. Nobody could access them. So supposedly it was easier. Now, technology is everywhere. So we have to have eyes around our head and keep, uh, keep uh, our attention focused on cybersecurity all the time, even when we sleep. And that is, I think, what we have to consider in the future. How to, how to go about it. Some optimism. Optimism? Well, guys like Doron. Olga, like myself, although I'm an old age pensioner but still working. Uh, yes, um, in, look at us. I mean, we are able to cope with it, but we have to work together. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Olga Buczewska. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a really pleasure to be in, in this such an amazing event. And actually, uh, at the beginning, if I may, I want to say that by default I accept all the invites from the Israel organizations because of the cybersecurity experts. Really, I am. So, uh, going back to the question, so the question was... Uh, what you're afraid of? What I'm afraid of. And what give you optimism when we are talking and thinking about the future okay. of cybersecurity? To oh. not be invited to Israeli events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid not to be invited. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I need to agree with uh, Jan now, which is uh, um, like very experienced and have like very high overview on lots of things that are going on in cybersecurity. And uh, I must say that I'm not worried about the technology at all, actually. I think that everything uh, lays uh, behind the people, and the people are the weakness uh, chain in this uh, in this process. Um, 
Um, I think that this is uh, starting with the with the managers and with, with the boards who ignore what is going on on the cyberspace, especially and the scale and the effectiveness of the attacks that they are raising. So they need to be more conscious about what is really going on in the cy cyberspace, and it's really hard to achieve and to go to the boards. Still, I think this is the problem. So uh, the technology is growing on a both sides. So the cyber attacks are growing, but on the other hand, on the other hand, we've got really nice and good tools to fight with it. So the technology is not a problem, I think, the people. Okay, um, the next question I would like to address to uh, uh, Colonel Grzegorz Mawecki. And referring to your uh, background as the intelligence officer, because one of the main role of the intelligence is to um, be part of early detection system and to provide the information. What are the biggest problems when we are talking about the threats from cyberspace and providing the information about the, uh, the f coming threats from cyberspace? Thank you very much for, for the question and first of all for the invitation and uh, to be part, uh, to be part uh, of a team uh, organizing uh, this, this event, to be partner of the organizers. It is a pleasure to, uh, to be uh, with you and to be here now. So, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, cyberspace, cybersecurity, cyber technology has, be, has uh, changed drastically in the whole landscape of security. Uh, uh, in nowadays, in the uh, modern um, uh, world. So the uh, cyber security gives us fantastic uh, new tools, new uh, instruments to combine uh, the most uh, uh, the serious uh, dangerous, but at the same time, the problem is that these tools are also used uh, um, uh, also, uh, very comfortable uh, new instruments to make damages for us. So, the the the, the challenge is to be uh, to be earlier, uh, to be more uh, efficient uh, as a security uh, uh, services or as a security system of the country, um, then the, the, the bad guys. Uh, and the, the real problem is that bad guys don't uh, have any limits in achieving, in, uh, uh, in gaining uh, um, a new uh, testing, uh, new uh, solutions, but the, the, the government is uh, much more, much less efficient in uh, in in, in uh, uh, old governments uh, because the state is in general much more stable and is not so flexible uh, uh, as as the the, the, the bad guys. So uh, the problem is that the f the the mm, uh, the danger, the threats are changing, are developing, improving much more uh, uh, faster than, than our activities to counter them. So uh, my, my main, uh, in that, uh, that uh, situation, my main uh, fears is that we won't be able to, uh, to counter uh, in, uh, the bad guys in, uh, making, uh, in making damages in in our environment, so that the the the, uh, the uh, damages will be uh, higher and, and and bigger than the benefits we we can uh, we can take. Thank you. And for the last but not least, a question to you, uh, because uh, the problem mentioned by the ladies was uh, that it's a human, not a technology, actually a uh, problem and. Uh, what 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 uh, can we do? And this problem exists for the for the long time. It's not like a new one. We are facing this problem for the more than twenty years uh, since the nineteen nineties. Uh, but 
What can we do actually that to make from this big vulnerability, I mean a human, so-called the human firewall? <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, I agree that one of the main factors or problems are the humans, uh, or us basically. Uh, just imagine uh, if uh, someone is going to utilize a deep fake thing about wanting to uh, invade uh, Poland and the U.S. and then the uh, U.S. Prime Minister also deep fake is going to say, oh, we're going to do something faster. And before you know it, uh, missiles are starting to, uh, uh, to fly over. Um, and why is that? Because we would panic. It's because people would, will panic and will expect their country to retaliate first before something might actually happen. Um, so what can we do? People need to uh, calm down. So if you uh, see something that, even if it makes sense or even if it doesn't make sense, but... Uh, um, um, but you have some kind of uh, a, a hunch that this might be fake, check. For example, I get many times uh, WhatsApps, especially, especially from my mother, um, send this to 10 uh, of your friends and you're uh, and uh, you're gonna be more protected or Microsoft is gonna give you uh, this uh, free something or something. I try to teach everyone before you uh, actually forward something Check in Google if, um, um, if someone already knows whether this is fake or not. Maybe we need to create uh, some kind of database of videos, of information, of news to check whether news are fake or not. How do you do that? By what people actually know. So utilize actually the power of knowledge of, ma of, uh, uh, of many people to create some kind of system. And it doesn't exist. I don't have it. I don't know what, what it is but somehow that we can actually utilize the collective knowledge of everyone to check whether news are real, uh, whether movies are real, uh, whether deep fake it's deep fake or it's real news, uh, and so on. And I'm sure that someone is gonna come up with uh, a blockchain uh, system of, uh, with, uh, with news going from uh, people to other people, making sure what's real and what's not. One of, one of the things also mentioned during this panel was that uh, the solution is that we people, like for example, uh, you, are, I think all of you which are participating in, in this panel, and uh, we are pretty aware that uh, in, the, in the IT and especially in the cybersecurity there is uh, abundance of men, but there is a scarcity of uh, women. So what can we do, and this is the question to, 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 to the ladies, uh, to engage more women into cybersecurity. <laughs> this is actually what we will be discussing at my round table. I invite everybody. This is also the reason I am addressing yes, this question. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. I started investigating um, in July this year um, when I had a, a webinar from, uh, organized by the European Union and it inspired me. Although I am in cyber security and information security for 40 years now, uh, also my friend here present, uh, we never actually um, had problems working in, in, um, in the industry. But um, when I found out uh, that there is a problem from the webinar, I started looking for surveys, research, and uh, everybody is saying the same. There are three or four main reasons why there are no women coming to cybersecurity. Um, one is a lack of mentors, <coughs> and that is true. Two, lack of role models, and that is why I'm starting you know, my career as a model. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, three um, difficulties at work, the atmosphere, the culture. Well, I must say, I also uh, had such uh, problems. Um, and four, uh, you can't uh, you can't forget that uh, sooner or later. Women go on maternity leave, have kids to look after, 
and somehow this has to be changed. There has to be more um, help given to these women when they come back from maternity leave and when they are raising small kids. And this is happening actually. You know, for instance, in Warsaw, there will be more and more. There are already, but more and more places at uh, what you call them, uh, uh, Zrotki. Well, that's for very small nursery, nursery uh, schools, right, and kindergartens. And so this is changing. But uh, do f do remember that we have a dramatic lack of specialists in cyber security, and women can bring not only the knowledge, the um, different point of uh, looking at. Uh, things uh, like attacks, but also, um, well, the, the, the simple fact that there are only what, 11 to 20 percent of women working, there is a whole, uh, whole number of women that we can bring in and they'll be good at it. That's a fact. We are good at it, aren't we, Teresa? Olga, we are good at it. So. Very serious, um, serious issue, and I would like to take this opportunity to say that uh, I just made a, uh, an alliance with Olga, and we'll be organizing a conference uh, next uh, next year with 100% women speakers to show that uh, in Poland we have also women working in cyber security. Uh, okay, just gonna, would, you, would you like to add something? Yeah, if, if I can. If I... Um, uh, thank you, Yana, for this. Uh, this is really important, and um, uh, I can say that I'm uh, an example of, of a mom. I have two uh, boys, uh, 10 and 11, so I've made the, the path for working still in cybersecurity and information security, um, and I got a chance to raise my kids. And uh, smoothly going to, to the previous uh, thing that I want to add uh, about the education from the ground. So I've made an, uh, like an experiment in the school of my kids and I asked during the meeting with the parents and I asked them, okay, so who of you installed co parental control on the phone of your kids? Oh, uh, sorry, the first question was, uh, uh, who of your, uh, does your kids have a, uh, internet connection with your mobile so, and everybody raised their hands but no one no one literally except of me installed current uh, parental control on the phone mobile phone so starting from the beginning like a very basic thing will be like the tool to, to, to overcome those threats that we are falling from cyberspace so maybe the good solution will be to introduce the uh, courses on the cyber security to nurseries in the kindergartens. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, that's in the strategy adopted on the 30th of uh, October. Uh, Mr. Kosha mentioned that's in the national strategy, actually. Uh, last question to, to Colonel Mawetsky and Mr. Jordan Davidson. Uh, Poland and Israel as a state, uh, which uh, challenges will face in the foreseeable future? I mean, of course, uh, challenges in the cyberspace. Well, in the cyber space, uh, this is one of the factors of this uh, current situation that, in general, we can say that we face the same threats now. Uh, global threats are uh, transmitted through the uh, cyberspace. So cyberspace is the, is the common... Uh, uh, area from we can uh, be uh, attacked uh, by uh, our our uh, enemies uh, or um, uh, uh, other uh, dangerous. So the the fact is that it that it the um, uh, result in the situation when we can cooperate much more efficiently than in the in the in the past because we are much more close than in the past and now uh, we can 
uh, we can cooperate to to uh, to fight the the, the common uh, dangers. So of course, every country has uh, uh, the, its its own um, uh, its own regional or uh, circumstantial um, uh, threats dangerous, but in general. Uh, threats through through cyberspace can uh, can uh, arrive from different uh, from different uh, directions. So the fact uh, now is that we can cooperate very strictly to uh, to to be better prepared uh, uh, to prevent to prevent the dangers from from this uh, space. And, uh, did, you, did you agree with uh, Colonel Wojcicki that these are sure the same threat as Poland in cyberspace? Challenges? First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm even capable to uh, speak as to the country challenges and so on. So I'm sure that uh, that is right. And from, uh, from uh, the collaboration between the countries, I'm sure that we have similar issues and that uh, they will be solved in similar ways. Uh, I know that I feel cyber protected when I am in Israel, so uh, uh, hopefully that everyone here will uh, will, will feel similarly. Uh, I do just want to say one thing, and I know that we are out of time, uh, one thing regarding the previous uh, 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 the previous question, one additional thing that women bring, uh, so up until four years ago I was uh, managed for over ten years by three different very strong women uh, at RSA Security, so about 30% of my uh, my organization was 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 of women. Uh, they bring calmness, something that uh, men don't always bring to work, and uh, they bring calmness. They know when to fight when when it's required, but when not, it's a much more stable uh, environment to work at. Um, and uh, I do believe that uh, you need to start it from uh, kindergarten and school. Uh, I do these kind of lectures about cybersecurity at my kids' school, and I even do it in some, uh, uh, in some of the universities to try and uh, attract more women uh, into cybersecurity, and not cybersecurity only, by the way, into technology in general. Some of it will go to cybersecurity. Um, so uh, uh, I uh, do salute you for your efforts. Thank you very much. We are out of time, so unfortunately I cannot ask you more questions. However, you're in the tables, and there will be probably more questions. So. Again, thank you very much for this interesting debate. Thank you very much. And now we are going into the roundtables, which uh, we would like to. We would. We invited our experts to to introduce the topic that that um, that they chose um, that will be taught on the on the tables. But we want your interaction. Your questions are valuable. And we, we, we understand that you also bring with yourself some knowledge, some experience, and uh, you can share and bring, uh, uh, bring much. I use your post-its, your notes, your pens, write down ideas and post-its. We'll try to make pictures afterwards and share them with, with all of you by email uh, later on. So I hopefully in a, in a half an hour and 40 minutes, We'll see a bunch of ideas from you uh, at the tables that we could share later on. Thank you.